Welcome back to our fertility Q&A. Uh, we are going to be going live with Dr. Kenneth Gelman of IVFMD tonight. And we have uh, definitely, as always, um, been looking at your questions you've submitted. Uh, so we'll be excited to answer those for you. Um, but please don't hesitate to uh, type your questions in the chat as well, because we'll also be answering those uh, as we go along. So I hope everyone's doing well tonight. Um, we are you know, now going into um, you know, a nice relaxing week, hopefully. We are gonna have our fertility virtual yoga tomorrow night at 6.30 on Zoom, if you guys would like to join. Uh, we actually have the link in our Instagram bio, so you can click on the link and you can sign up, and it's restorative, so it's not a crazy, like, active yoga session uh, that much, but it's mostly, you know, focused on uh, getting you to that nice, parasympathetic, balanced state, so um, so feel free to, uh, to come on in and um, do our 45-minute virtual yoga. It's free. Um, we ask for donations to Resolve if you'd like to do that. Uh, there's a little link you can donate uh, to Resolve on that. Um, and then we'll actually be, uh, oh, there's Dr. Gelman. So I'll go ahead and bring him in. We'll be going live in a few minutes with um, with Dr. Gelman and when, we, when he pops up here in a little while. There he is. Hi, how are you? How's everybody? Good, yay. We're here again, it's Wednesday. Yeah. And we're back for another Q&A. Um, and I was just pulling up the questions now. So uh, we were, we actually uh, just got sent a few of them, but you guys can definitely still type them in and you can ask us plenty of questions. So for those of you who do not know Dr. Gilman, um, he works with IVFMD and he practices um, well, all around, but mostly in Cooper City office. Uh, and um, go ahead and introduce yourself if uh, you'd like to say a few words. Sure. Uh, I'm Dr. Kenneth Gelman. I'm one of the many doctors of IVFMD as it keeps expanding every week, it seems like. <laughs> and uh, I'm in the Cooper City office along with Dr. Wood and Dr. Gerkowitz, sometimes in the South Miami office, but you know, less often now than before, but occasionally. Um, and it's great to be here. It's always great to have these sessions and answer these questions. And it's a, it's a, it's a great, a lot of fun for us too. It's, and it's interesting and I hope people are, you know, tuning in and learning a lot. Yeah, definitely. This is good knowledge to have. It's nothing to stress anyone out. It's just basically to uh, feel more empowered and make better decisions and have better questions to ask when you go to your visits too with your provider as well. And hopefully get to your goal much faster because you're, more knowledgeable. I'm glad. Thank you for saying that uh, we're your favorite. <laughs> we love being here. So we, we do. We do. Jump in if you're ready um, with our first question. And so I'll go ahead and read it um, on my screen here. Uh, so uh, it's from someone who said, I went for my ultrasound before my embryo transfer and I didn't have the three stripes in my lining. So my cycle was canceled and we have to start over. Do you know what might be the cause of the stripes not being there? They have been these, uh, they have been there during previous ultrasounds. Yeah, I mean, that's a little unusual. Um, you know, I mean, presumably, I mean, the endometrium is well prepared. Um, you know, I assume this is a frozen transfer that that's what the person's doing. It's, you know, mm -hmm. But um, I assume that everything was working well up until then, you know, to cancel it on the day before or two days before. It's a little unusual. Actually, this, this happened to me uh, the other day, actually. Um, I was consulting on a patient who actually was, I guess, you know, preparing to see us just in case, but she was going through a cycle up in uh, New York, actually, and we were monitoring center, and she's had a couple ultrasounds, and her endometrium looked decent, but I actually scanned her on the day, our last monitoring day, actually, the day before she was supposed to fly up there for her transfer, uh, which actually was supposed to take place Monday, and her lining was barely a four or five millimeter. It was trilaminar. It had three lines, but it was, it was really thin. Mm -hmm. And it was an unusual thing because I looked at the previous ultrasounds and, you know, while there was a different machine used, maybe a little different technique, it shouldn't have been that much different. 
So it was a little unusual. And, um, you know, I actually spoke with them up in New York and, you know, she canceled the transfer because we were going to not take a chance on transferring an embryo in that situation. And, and the situation is, is not clear exactly what's going on with this person. I mean, I presume they were using the estrogen patches correctly, uh, you know, um, and that's all she was on. We use things differently in our practice. We use, mm -hmm. you know, oral, vaginal, and, you know, we kind of do a little bit more than they were doing up there. And, um, you know, I mean, is it possible that this person was using oil and not absorbing the, the patch? Or is there some reason that this was, you know, is it a generic patch that you just changed? Maybe it was mm -hmm. totally... Um, ineffective it was you know okay. something was wrong with a patch i mean it's hard to know mm -hmm. so but in those situations you know you don't take a chance yeah. um and you go back to the drawing board and you start over like um mm -hmm. and actually today i was just shown an ultrasound from a patient who's doing an era test and i saw there's some questions about era we'll probably talk about that yeah. and um she was she's a um uh, she's uh, in another country and we're monitoring her there at another site in another country, which we do a lot of, actually. So um, she's in another country, and you're like, or she's going to be in another. Country. She she lives. She's her husband um, is a, in construction, and they're constructing, you know, uh, embassies. I think in another country. Okay. So she's there. She lives there. You know, they they've been there for a few years now. And, uh, you know, we have, you know, there's some good monitoring centers there. The physicians there are very cooperative. And they, you know, they email us the ultrasound. And, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a very convenient thing now in this day and age with technology. You know, we can take care of patients anywhere. And uh, so I received her ultrasound and uh, her endometrium was barely a four. And this was on plenty of estrogens you know mm -hmm. but obviously i'm going to start over and, and change things up and you know that's a, that's a real quandary for some people because that thin endometrium and this is her first you know attempt at you know frozen embryo transfer or an era cycle so we never knew when she had anything like this until we actually start medicating her now in this situation you know maybe maybe she's not absorbing that medication well she's not processing it well she's not reacting to it well maybe this other person who just asked the same question maybe maybe these people need a natural cycle transfer you know if they ovulate regularly maybe they do better with their own estrogen or endogenous estrogen their own uh, chemicals instead of us giving this yeah. you know all these synthetic things so, you know, sometimes we, we have to do that. And maybe, maybe in this situation, I might have to do that with this patient. So, you know, I think going back to the drawing board with that other patient, uh, you know, I don't know exactly what's going on there. Obviously, we didn't see her other ultrasounds and stuff. But uh, if it is an issue and she's not developing the appropriate lining, maybe she needs a natural cycle uh, or try a cycle with higher doses of estrogens and you know, other things, I mean, we tried Viagra, we've tried all those things. I mean, they, 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 they don't oh. work. Acupuncture is a good thing to add, obviously, anytime. Yeah. But uh, I've tried Nupagen infusions a few times, which is, um, you know, uh, used off label. Nupagen is a drug that actually raises white counts in the oncology uh, realm. But we've used it and infused it into the lining um, slowly uh, on two occasions during the cycle and it worked for this one patient who had thin lining repetitively, even with natural and, you know, okay. so, so we use that. So I, you know, anecdotally it worked. I can't say for sure whether it would be something, you know, hundred percent on everybody, you know, but it's, it's something that could work. Well, oh, definitely. It's good to get monitored. Like, yeah, give yourself oh, for time. Sure. <laughs> oh, for sure. Um, and uh, I've been trying to conceive for about a year now, and I continually do the ovulation test, but I feel like I limit my water intake when doing that so I don't compromise the test in any way. Does that make sense? Do you have any advice for that? Do well, I need to limit water, or can I drink as much water as I like? Yeah, I mean, that's, um, you know, actually, mo most of the kits, I think, give directions to test first thing in the morning, mm -hmm. which I kind of never agreed with because uh, your urine is the most concentrated first thing in the morning. So if anything, you might get a slight false positive from concentrated urine. 
So what I tell, to people, tell people to do is to drink water and test late in the day, four or five o'clock, but stop drinking water maybe two hours before that. And that way you won't have such concentrated urine. Your urine will be a little more, more dilute, more normal. And if you really get a positive, well, gee, you're really surging. Yeah. You know? Okay. You know, so I would not necessarily tell this person to limit water intake. Okay. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, some people say to do like morning and night, right? The, I like well, to drink. It's a bit I mean, you know, I, I, think, I think those kits, first of all, are about 70% accurate. Sometimes they can be misleading. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, but I tend to tell people to, yeah, you could try it twice a day. You're going to use a lot of strips. But, um, you know, you want to make sure you're not getting a false positive. You want to make sure it's really dark, okay. you know. Um, and I think, you know, drinking water and making sure, you know, in the afternoon, start drinking a couple hours before. And if it really turns dark in the evening, I think then you're, you're more apt to have a more accurate test. That's good. Of it. Yes, for sure. And I guess certain ones are better than others. I mean, do you have a recommendation for <clears throat> Not really. I mean, I mean, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, you know, I think some people go to the dollar store and get them. Yeah. Apparently the dollar store sells them. Yes. Um, you know, mm -hmm. some people get these fancy kits, the clear blue and, you know, all that. they're expensive, you know. Um, but I think the, uh, the obvious, obvious, you know, the standard ovulation 10 day kit is, you know, if they don't know when they're ovulating, a 10 day kit from Walgreens is adequate. Um, you know, okay. if you know, I think they make a five day kit too. That you know you you know more accurate you know if you know your window you could use something like a five day kit where you don't have to spend as much. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, and we have a question from earlier actually too. Um, will a one centimeter peri para ovarian cyst delay the start of an IVF treatment? No other ovarian cysts were visualized. Thank you. A one centimeter shouldn't. Right. One centimeter. Yeah. That's no, great. it's nothing. Okay. Nothing. I would think those would be common, right? <laughs> How often do you yeah, see, see them? them? We see a parallel wear and cyst. We see them. Yeah, I mean, you know, we don't. I don't delay people because of that. I mean, I mean, if you have a three or four centimeter cyst, it's going to probably impact things. Or, you know, sometimes we try to get rid of them before the cycle. Uh, we try various uh, medications like agestin, things like that. Sometimes we even drain them, right? You know, at the start of the cycle, and you know, okay. they always they always come back usually. <laughs> okay. Yeah, definitely. I think fibroids are more common than we think, and and oh, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's like most people don't have symptoms, so that's what it is. But our patients are getting ultrasounds all the time, so we can see so many things. That's we find common. stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, as I had this the other day with a patient, didn't know she had any fibroids. You know, a gynecologist maybe told her, maybe she mm -hmm. didn't, you know, pay attention. And you know, they say what I have what you know, and, and then we have to you know explain to them what they are. You know, fibroids obviously are all about location, really. Yeah. Um, location, location, location. Um, you know, be nine, but they're still a nuisance. Yeah, <laughs> they can be. Oh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, they can be. They definitely mm -hmm. can be. Yeah. Um, now we have a question in the chat here uh, for type one diabetic patient PCOS and has gone through multiple rounds of letrozole, seven point five with success on ovulating, but not able to conceive. Yeah, what options are recommended? Now, now, what was that question? She was, she was a type 1 diabetic? She is, yes. Uh -huh. And she has PCOS, uh, multiple rounds of letrozole um, with six. Oh, she, has, she was able to ovulate with letrozole, but not conceive. Uh -huh. And so what options would you, um, multiple rounds, I don't know how many that means. Yeah, I don't know either. You know, yeah. uh, again, um, it depends on her age. I yeah. mean, you know, some people do six, six cycles before they move on. Some people do two to three, you know, it depends if it's covered or, you know, if your, your monitoring's covered, how they're monitoring you, are you doing IUIs? Um, you know, a lot of that has to be looked into. Um, maybe, maybe try IUIs. You can attempt that. That might help things on occasion. Um, you know, uh, or if you're ready to go to IVF, go right to IVF. Um, but make sure your diabetic control is in, in good mm -hmm. shape. I mean, your A1Cs right. should be consistently around six, um, you know, and no higher. You want to avoid complications in the pregnancy. So uh, make sure your, your doctors are taking good care of that. Um, yeah. But that, that's not going to necessarily cause you not to get pregnant. 
but it'll influence the course of the pregnancy, obviously. Well, right. I mean, is there a certain number of cycles that you recommend if some, for, for using letrozole, you know, to the point where you're like, okay, it's time to move on or uh, not really? Just... I've, had, I've had people do seven or eight cycles. I've had, mm -hmm. I had one do, I think, nine. Um, and, you know, but this person, I think, had gotten pregnant before. And okay. we were pretty confident she could get pregnant. We weren't really sure. She must have had a little endometriosis, maybe. So, you know, she wasn't, you know, uh, ready to go to IVF. Or, and by, I think the eighth cycle or something, she got pregnant. <laughs> so, you know, we know potentially a lot of these people probably will get pregnant, given it long enough. Most people, you know, are very anxious and nervous and worried. And, you know, they, they want... Everybody, you know, wants results, obviously, yesterday. And, you know, I think most people, I guess, a lot of insurances aren't covering what we do. And, you know, if they're being monitored by us or they're trying IUIs, you know, it gets expensive, too. So a lot of them will just say, well, let's maybe do IVF because, you know, it hands down is, is like nothing else. I mean, it's so effective. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I mean, and also, like we talked about last week, the preparation, the the detective work you do beforehand is helpful um, because that insulin resistance could be affecting the ovulation or the egg quality and all kinds of things. So it's good to make sure, like you said, the you know the glucose insulin are good and that's been managed well. Yeah, well, you know, the, the, that other individual is a type one diabetic. I mean, all that's not gonna, you mm -hmm. know, uh, that's not gonna be taken into. Uh, that's different, you know, and that individual, that person's on insulin, mm -hmm. but you know, in a in a, in a possible type 2 diabetic or in a uh, PCOS individual, we know insulin resistance, which is sort of the opposite of type 1 diabetes. Um, that is going to be an important thing to look at. And we do look at that. Yes. Um, and we make sure we manage those patients ahead of time. So, um, you know, as, as effectively as we can. I mean, obviously metformin, you know, weight control is extremely important. Infl inflammation control you know, we can tr control what we can control. You know, there's certain things out of yeah. our hands, but but certain things we can definitely help people with and counsel them and, you know, say this is sometimes in your in, in your situation, maybe this should be more of a process, yeah. you know, and more um, and not something you would want to, you know, do right away because, you know, you may not do well in the pregnancy. Maybe you need to get healthier first and prepare yourself better, and you know you'll have better luck down yeah, the road. That this person is ovulating, so that's good. You know, like that's yeah, good. Oh. yeah. That's, no, that's a good sign. I mean, mm -hmm. again, depends on her age. Mm -hmm. Depends on uh, did they do an HSG? I assume they did. Mm -hmm. uh, the sperm factors. How's that? You know, I mean, there's, there's other questions we don't uh, know here. But, you know, assuming all those things are normal, again, depending on her age and how anxious she is, it might be time to go yeah. up a notch. For sure. Okay. And then we have, um, let me just take care of the questions we have on our, in our messaging, just so we can see uh, that first. And I'll go the is it normal to feel some left side cramps around five weeks? Prior? Looks, looks like that person answered. She never had an HSG and, uh, and no sperm test yet. Well, you should get those. Oh. Oh, okay. She did type something in the okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no HSG, but several yeah. rounds. Yeah, I would. I would. If I, I would get those things. Yeah. You know, I think they're helpful. Okay. Oh, so you have a that, consultation with me on June 11th. Okay. Talk to an RE. I'm, ex I'm excited to meet you. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds <laughs> like he's going to a gynecologist meeting, which is. Is that do said Dr. Kenneth? So I guess that's me. I don't know. Maybe it's another, another Dr. Kenneth. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. oh yeah. yeah okay yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great yeah. um yeah because definitely you're not going to be doing that with no hsg or no steven <laughs> she's nice <laughs> she's she's sending me hearts that's for yes. right. <laughs> hearts for dr gelman thank you oh okay so she's, she's oh nice. it's me okay <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's kind of funny huh <laughs> You'll be in good hands for sure. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that was great. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, 
And then I'm all okay. Oh, yes, this is the question I was going to ask. Is it normal to feel some left side cramps at around five weeks uh, pregnant? You're going to feel cramps. I mean, I think uh, a lot of people tell us all the time that they have cramps. Um, they feel, you know, nonspecific kind of things, um, you know, that usually mean nothing. Just, you know, things are obviously growing and stretching and moving down there as the baby grows, you know. But obviously at five weeks, you know, you're early. Um, you know, you got to make sure, obviously, everything is in the right place. Let's make sure. I assume it, maybe you, sh you should, you know, speak to your doctor about that because you want to make sure you don't have an ectopic or anything else uh, that's causing that. If there's any bleeding or spotting, I would definitely get looked at. So, um, you know, if you're concerned to the point where it's really something unusual, get looked at. There's, there's no harm in getting an ultrasound and getting reassurance and say, hey, this is nothing. Forget it. That's, yeah. And I mean, I think implants can, can feel like this for a while too, even though it occurred earlier. Like, I just, I mean, I, I just think that, you know, some people feel, we call it like twinges, you know? Yeah, they feel twinges and things like that. Mm -hmm. Some people have a cyst, maybe, a, you know, a corpus luteum. Occasionally somebody uh, has a corpus luteum there that, you know, ruptures or has a, you know, problem, uh, rare. But, you know, somebody with cramps, specifically one-sided, you know, a mm -hmm. um, little bit, you know, maybe unusual. Most people say they got mid, you know, mid-abdominal kind of, they feel crampy and funny, you know. Um, so maybe that person should get an ultrasound and just make sure everything's in the right place. Yes, I'm sure. I mean, five weeks, I guess you can do, yeah. you can see something, right? Sure. Well, you know, if, if the betas, you know, maybe, I, I hope they're watching our betas. Uh, hopefully everything is, uh, you know, going up appropriately. Um, but you know, if there's any concern about an ectopic, I would start looking. I mean, at five weeks, you you see a gestational sac. Yeah. You know, you usually see a little tiny little sac. You may not see anything else, but at least you know the sac is in the uterus. Yeah. That's not somewhere else. Now, if the person had uh, clomiphene, um, you know, this could that could be an issue only because if somebody got clomid or femora and they were not monitored, which is one of the things that I don't yeah. think is a good idea. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if they if they cert, you know, they did their own ovulation kit, for example, like some of the gynecologists do that, they'll give somebody a three or four month prescription of clomiphene and you know, they might even increase the dose if the patient doesn't get pregnant. So they might give them 100 milligrams. And the people, you know, do their own, uh, you know, once they get their period, they start the clomiphene and then they do their own ovulation kits and they get the positive. Mm -hmm. And then they try and then they get pregnant. And, you know, who knows how many follicles that person ovulated. Mm -hmm. Now, is it possible that person has you know, multiple gestation and, you know, or a heterotopic pregnancy, you know, um, you know, it, uh, <laughs> how you doing? It's about my mask. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, because like an extra follicle got fertilized and one, you know, got maybe got stuck in the tube and one's in the uterus, who knows? But, you know, that's, that's one of the things that I think is a little dangerous about doing cycles that are not monitored by ultrasound because you know when we monitor somebody the nurses are very careful hey they'll say listen you got three follicles here we're going to cancel your cycle mm -hmm. you know then we're not going to you know ovulate anybody with rare exception with more than two yeah. so you know you got to be careful with these things you know you can't just be cavalier and say you know hey you know i got pregnant and you got to know exactly what's going on there. Yeah. And I think, I think it's smart to be monitored by ultrasound. And that HCG, yeah, uh, HCG is very high or that sort of thing when you first start. It, I mean, it could be. Well, it, it could be. It's not always the case. You know, we see very high, sometimes really high first betas with IVF and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's a singleton. It doesn't mean, yeah. you know, and we, you know, so, so it doesn't mean one split because we're, we're really putting one embryo on everybody now. But, yeah. um, you know, I mean, it's somebody like who's being monitored by a gynecologist, for example. Yeah. You know, you keep that in mind, you know, when they give you the prescription that you, you may you may ovulate more than one follicle, especially if their AMHs are high, mm. you know.
you got to, you got to also go by the experience of the gynecologist. Hopefully they have the experience to give you those drugs. So they should be asking for an ultrasound around, um, patient time, I would think, right? Well, they, they do, they, you know, some of them do, most of them don't, um, you know, I mean, you know, it's just, it's just one of the things that I have always had a fear of. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, the, the people that are coming to see us, um, usually have gone through the gynecologist maybe, and they've had three cycles of Clomid already, you know, um, and they got away with it, so to speak, because they didn't get pregnant. <laughs> but, you know, the ones that get pregnant, I'm just raising that question about this person, you know, with the left-sided pain, you know. Okay. Well, good to, good to watch out for, for sure. Because we don't want to have, like, a ton of follicles. And then <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what yeah. I'm saying, you know. I, you know, that's, that's why I just brought it up, because mm -hmm. it, it could result in something like that. Okay, very good. Um, okay, when is it okay to put embryos in for IVF? When is it okay to put embryos? Well, that's uh, it's oh, kind two. of a, oh, oh, sorry. Huh? Okay. When is yeah. it okay to put two? Two. I think it meant to be, yes, it was supposed to be two embryos in for IVF. Yeah. I mean, I mean, very rare exception these days. I mean, if, you know, the person is uh, typically older, uh, maybe didn't have the best quality embryos, you know, mm -hmm. according to the... Uh, Embryologists, that these embryos don't look very good, you know, it's maybe reasonable to put two in. Um, maybe, or if the person's younger, they've had multiple failures for whatever reason, maybe two. Um, but, you know, with very rare exception, do we do that these days? Um, uh, but there are on certain occasions that I have where, where I'm go actually going to do it on one person I could think of right now. But, you know, that person's had multiple, multiple failures. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and we feel it's appropriate. Yeah. I mean, it's individualized, I think. Yeah, it, it is. But, you know, I mean, people coming in, you know, for the first time, you know, a 28-year-old mm -hmm. going through IVF is not going to get two embryos. You know, mm -hmm. uh, a 42-year-old might, you know, mm -hmm. but not a 28-year-old. So, you know, anybody certainly under 35 is not getting two embryos for the most part. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and, and most places in the, around the country are like that now. I mean, I think, I think the multiple pregnancy rate has really gone down. Because, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the clinics, including ours, really have been very instrumental on doing that. And I think it's, it's, it's the right thing to do. Yeah. I mean, you know, we want, we want to... Uh, um, you know, work with the insurance companies on this because I think they're, they're actually, and you know, some of the insurance companies actually, uh, you know, could get kind of tough on the patient. You know, they'll say, listen, you know, you know, they, they could do anything they want, actually. They could say, listen, you had a double embryo transfer, and, you know, they could make it tough on their insurance. Um, we don't want to lose any accreditations. You know, we want to work with them on this. We want to reduce costs. Mm -hmm. And we want to, you know, make it safer for the patient because a single embryo is more apt to go to term, mm -hmm. um, be a healthy baby. And that's what we want. We want healthy, full-term babies. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And healthy for the mom and also the babies too. So, and I mean, years ago, that was, it was pretty much very common to see multiples, you know. But, well, years ago, I think we were yeah. a little bit like cowboys, you know. Yeah. <laughs> like, and, uh, I, you know. Two embryos. And I, th I think it took Octomom really to kind of change that. Yeah, I remember that. Was that IVF or was that IUI? I thought it was IVF. It was IVF, I think. It was? It was IVF. Okay. I, think, I think it was IVF. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And then there was some report I saw, what was it, two weeks ago, some women in another country had nine babies. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Nine. They, they only saw seven, but she had nine. Wow. Wow. Oh. Oh man, that's not good. Yeah. Well, yes, for sure. Get the ultrasound. <laughs> Definitely. Yes, um, IVF MD does have financing. Okay. Plans, they do. And as someone said they're having an initial visit with you too, to like what to expect, or I'm not sure if it's you. It's at it's like at a, at your center, um, to kind of like know what to expect. I think whenever they come in, so. Um, I, I kind of skipped over that question, but it was in there, I know, so. Mm -hmm. 
So what are the, um, I guess they need to have their medical records for sure. And even well, over well, it's helpful. It's helpful. You know, mm -hmm. um, you know, if it's obviously if they're recent and things like that, you know, but it's always helpful to see, you know, what's been done and what other doctors have thought about or what they've, what they've, uh, were planning on doing with them. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, I guess what to expect is your partner's there with you, right? If, if possible. And I'm sorry. You guys see both uh, partners, right? Um, oh yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's great to have the, uh, the men come in too, you know, cause obviously they're part of this mm -hmm. and, um, you know, we always like to, you know, talk with the men and find out what they're up to and, um, you know, find out what kind of lifestyles they're living too. Mm -hmm. because uh, sperm, you know, is an important part of this equation. And we want the sperm healthy. You know, we want to, we want to ask the guys all the typical questions about their health. And, um, you know, I always, like I mentioned this before, I always try to do a whole lab profile on the men. Yeah. Uh, in addition, and that includes, you know, their testosterone, their FSH, LH levels, uh, estrogen levels, um, you know, plus we also get like their cholesterols, you know, we get stuff like that. So yeah. I tend to, you know, and, and inflammatory markers, you know, um, just like women, I, you know, we tend to pick up, um, you know, abnormalities, uh, in the men too. And, um, you know, we like to counsel them like if their cholesterol is high, you know, uh, yeah. we'll get on them for that. Um, you know, we're, we're all about health too. So it, it's, um, it's very important to talk to the men because, you know, sometimes these guys are, you know, maybe they're doing things they shouldn't be doing, like taking testosterone or you know, some kind of thing that they think is helping them in the gym, but really is not helping their sperm, you know. And then, you know, we'll find out with their sperm count and we'll kind of back into the problem and, uh, you know, like she's asking if men have low sperm count, do they get treatment? Yeah, they do. We do. Yeah. We do. You know, yeah. we'll, we'll put them on clomiphene or Arimidex or HCG. You know, mm -hmm. we'll do all those sorts of things and, uh, and see what we can improve um, and not neglect the men. And if we can't get it done, Dr. Ramasamy will get it done, you know. Mm -hmm. So we have all that covered. And, you know, so that's why it's very important for the men to, to come in and yeah, not, not be neglected. They are. Um, sometimes they're also doing things that they think might be healthy, like eating really healthy and that sort of thing. But we, you know, have seen where they, you know, patients have eaten like fish every day, but like yeah. deep sea fish, you know, thinking, oh, it's, it's healthy. And it's like, well, you know, like, like sometimes the men are the cook of the house, they're the cooks. Yeah. You know, so we talk to them and, you know, they, they get they get ideas and, you know, yeah. they come back and they tell us, you know, what they're doing. And uh, yeah. it's really kind of great to hear that. It's good. I mean, but I, I'd say, like, you know, that sometimes if you're having a lot of seafood, that mercury level might be too yeah. high. Yeah, we, we, we find that all the time. Right. Yeah. Sushi eaters or seafood eaters, you know, like I, I found that with um, people going to even a Whole Foods, you know, you figure that everything is is uh, is properly you know sustain there and all that apparently not um it has mercury uh, it has mercury yes mm -hmm. they do so you know we pick it up because we have mercury on the profile yeah okay so that's good that's part of your normal uh your test for 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 the men as well or yeah okay good awesome um okay so we have a few questions we're going to jump back into the ones that were submitted earlier um so uh, a topic treated with methotrexate never saw a baby on tube. Chance of losing tube. A topic. Um, well, it was probably a very low beta if you didn't see anything. Uh, but uh, I, but sometimes their ectopics like, can be very difficult to see. Sometimes mm -hmm. they they are you know like particularly in, in, in IVF and heterotopic pregnancies, where it, those instances where two embryos have been transferred and one doesn't stay put one migrates into the tube. There was been a couple of occasions where we couldn't, you know, find the second one. We assumed it possibly wasn't there. Uh, and the patient, you know, started having pain and unfortunately mm -hmm. ended up in the ER, you know, with surgery, 
you know, these things can be very difficult to see okay. on occasion. So, you know, just because the classic thing is, you know, you see it in the tube and mm -hmm. you're having pain and bleeding, you know, it's not always the case. But if this is a very early ectopic, you know, like low betas and things like that, that, you know, you're not going to lose the tube. But, you know, if it's a high beta, if you're farther along, your beta is in five, six thousand, ten thousand, you know, that, that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. So that's got to be very carefully watched in that okay. situation. Yeah, and it can even go into the fembrae, right? All kinds of areas, or is it? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, can be, they can be very hard to find. Okay. You know, so. um, and then, what are the steps of an ERA medication required? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there are. Uh, medicated ERAs, typically most of them are medicated, and there are ones that are not. So like we discussed earlier, you know, some of these people who, for example, may be on medicated frozen embryo transfer cycles, we're finding that they don't develop a very thick lining, even after multiple attempts to increase the lining thickness with various uh, changes in medication dosages. Um, some people might do better with a natural cycle where we let them ovulate. So the ERA cycle has been designed to do both ways. Um, typically, most people will do medicated cycles because most people, I think, probably do pretty well in frozen embryo transfer cycles with medications that we prepare. And that way we can, you know, in the medicated cycles, we can actually program the cycle so that the transfer will fall on a definite date. So, for example, you know, if Mrs. Jones wants to, you know, uh, wants her transfer to occur on, you know, July 8th, fine. We'll, we'll work backwards and prep her uh, endometrium so that she should be ready to go on June 8th. Okay. Now, other individuals where they need a natural cycle, you can't, get a definite date, you know, because we don't know when they're going to ovulate, if they're going to ovulate, you know, how well they're going to ovulate, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe we know previously from femora cycles, for example, they do pretty well with that. We can use femora, let them ovulate, and then prep them with a little progesterone or sometimes a little estrogen after ovulation and then transfer them whenever they're supposed to be transferred. So there's ERA cycles that are designed for both. Um, an ERA will uh, detect what day we're supposed to transfer you uh, or after how many days of progesterone. Um, so if we do a medicated cycle, we do a mock frozen embryo transfer cycle and medicate you just like we're going to do mm -hmm. a frozen embryo transfer. And we do a biopsy on your lining after 120 hours of progesterone plus or minus three hours. Send that sample to the genetics people. And they come back and they say, oh, you're pre-receptive. You need an extra 24 hours of progesterone. So we'll get that result. For the actual transfer then, we'll give them an extra 24 hours of progesterone. We'll just start their progesterone a day earlier. And so the day of their embryo transfer, we will have them have the extra 24 hours of progesterone and they'll be transferred in the appropriate window based on what the ERA test tells us. Similarly, in natural cycles, we can do the same thing, but they give us a protocol. I think it's on the sixth day of progesterone or seventh day, I forget exactly the day, that, that we, we actually do the biopsy uh, in a natural cycle. And we send it to them, we tell them it's a natural cycle, and they tell us exactly, you know, what's transpiring in a natural cycle, if they're receptive or not. So we can still do it in a natural cycle. I didn't know that. See, every single yeah. time is something new. It's yeah. <laughs> yeah, which is which is a very which is a cool thing. Mm -hmm. Because you know, nat natural cycles are cool. They really are. You know, um, it, it's it's uh, it's I think a lot. It's very appealing to most people because you know we're not giving them the extra medicines. They're saving money. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a much more, quote, natural approach without all this extra stuff. And, and it has its appeal, and it definitely has its uses. 
So ERA, ERA cycles can be scheduled that way too. Okay, very neat. So naturally you're saying uh, to check going and this is in preparation for an IVF or could it be used for IUI or any other, uh, would you recommend that? What's that, the ERA? The ERA, yes. What no, ERAs, ERAs for, for, for embryo transfers for, uh, for, you know, frozen embryo transfer cycles, mm -hmm. not for okay. IUIs or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, IUIs or IUIs. I mean, yeah. they, they either work or they don't, <laughs> you know? So, yeah. A natural IVF cycle means, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we, we don't, we don't do, um, uh, you know, we don't do too many natural IVF cycles itself. I mean, right. you know, don't, we don't let people ovulate and then take their eggs out. Mm -hmm. We let people ovulate and then put their embryo in. Yes. That's what that is. Okay. So it's not, it's not a, uh, it's not a natural IVF cycle where we just let people ovulate and take one egg out. I mean, I think okay. that's been tried as kind of with dismal results. Um, so it's more I mean, for a transfer. Something to be said for like less hormones, the better sometimes, you know, as far as. Sometimes it is. Sometimes less is better. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, down the road, we don't know the repercussions of being on estrogen for a long period of time. Or who knows? I mean, I, you know. Well, you know, I think I think those things are really moot points in, in the sense that, you know, I mean, those questions have been raised a hundred times about mm -hmm. whether IVF and all these things cause cancer and all that. I mean, it's really not, not going to be anything significant um, because obviously look how much it's being done all, all over the world every single day and you know it's not like you know the incidence of breast cancer uterine cancer and all these things are increasing to the point where it's due to ivf i mean that's been mm -hmm. that's being scrutinized and yeah you know, that would have been shut down years ago believe me right i guess i was referring to the you know if we're and and don't forget and don't forget pregnancy is a much higher estrogen situation for nine full months mm -hmm. right Yes, I mean, I, you know, I was thinking if people are taking unopposed though estrogen for a long period of time, that might have an issue. They might have an issue. Yeah, yeah I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not so sure. You know, maybe in susceptible individuals, you know, who are mm -hmm. BRCA positive or, you know, these kinds of things. But you know, I think for these people who are doing these transfers, no, I don't think there's much. Yeah. I think it's very negligible. Okay, good. Yeah, I got so I mean the ERAs can be very useful, right? For patients also that only have like maybe one embryo. So they're like, I want to make sure it's gonna be put in at the right time and you know. Well, you know, I still think the ERA has value. Some doctors don't um some doctors in our practice don't do them, but I think it has value. But I typically combine the ERA with other things. So I call it the ERA, but it's actually three tests in one. It's 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 uh the progesterone part is the ERA, and then I do an EIP with it, which is a, um, an immune profile where we looked at, you know, cytokines and things like that in the endometrium, right at the interface where the embryo is, okay. and a regular endometrial biopsy. I combine three things at once and look for, you know, endometritis with a regular biopsy. So three samples are generated. Off of one biopsy, then? like one Yeah, okay. yeah. So, so, you know, it becomes a little more comprehensive, but I, you know, I tend to call it the ERA or, you know, it's not mm -hmm. really the right name, I guess. Okay. I should, should call it a, I don't know, functional <laughs> endometrium function profile or something. Yeah. Type yeah. in that. What do you think this panel should be called? <laughs> EIP. Patient asks, what's the second test? It's called EIP. Okay. Um, endometrial immune profile. Mm -hmm. Endometrial immune profile. So three yeah. in one. Three for the price of one. So. <laughs> Three for the well, yeah. There's a charge for all of them, but yeah. 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 <laughs> but it, but it's it's a comprehensive profile. Okay, very good. Oh, we're getting a lot of questions, but I want to make sure we get to our earlier questions so uh, we can make sure that, that those get answered or answer them, and then we're going to. Mm -hmm. um, answer some of the questions in the chat too that we have. So um, so one uh, question was, is acupuncture, since we're talking about the ERA, there's just another ERA question here. Um, is during ERA or before, is acupuncture necessary? And I mean, we <coughs> continue or, I mean, if we're treating patients during, a, for preparation for IVF and the ERA does fall into that schedule, we just treat as we normally do. I mean, I, I don't think anything has changed for that. Well, I, I, just to reiterate what you're saying here is that 
I mean, the ERA should be exactly what you're going to do for the real mm -hmm. transfer. Right. If you're going to change things in the real transfer, why do the ERA? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. so, so the ERA should be exactly the same thing. It's a complete practice cycle. So you know mm -hmm. every little component is included in the ERA. Um, so acupuncture, if the patient's doing acupuncture, they should definitely do it during the ERA mm -hmm. and then definitely do it during the actual transfer. Yes. Yeah, I mean, we're not present exactly during that time, like physically on site. For the, we do it up until then, you know, it, you know, weekly treatments or biweekly and uh, and the day before or, you know, if that falls in, under that time. Uh, but for the actual transfer, we, we will be able to perform it, you know, during the procedure if the patient is requesting it. Um, yeah. So that's the only difference we would think, you know, as far as that's concerned. But I think supplements, things like that, you're not changing anything with that. No, no. You're putting them on they're continuing through that um so everything's kind of the same sort of scenario i think there so definitely yeah yeah uh, absolutely because that's just the point of it right make sure. it a dry run we recreate Complete dry run yes yeah and um as far as, and you guys used to do mock transfers does that happen anymore or is this kind of replacing it or or not? well we do it i on occasion we do them but but we actually do them during the actual transfer because because we have a because me, you know, they give me a mock catheter and I, you know, right when you're actually doing the actual transfer, you got, you got the ultrasound image and you actually can put a mock catheter in there and see exactly, you know, where you are. And I leave the outer mock catheter in. So the embryologist then comes and we feed in the other actual live catheter. So, so the trial is actually done with the actual transfer. Okay, so you can do both then, right? Yeah. You, oh, yeah. Okay. Um, and another transfer question about acupuncture, because there was really good one, that one, um, before and after on transfer date. Um, it says acu for transfer. So we typically do two treatments the day of transfer if you're having acupuncture done on site. Uh, and that is from a protocol um, that we use that's been used for many years. Uh, and it's basically geared towards helping with relaxation and blood flow for that first treatment. And then also we find, you know, that uh, we've had feedback that the cervix is actually easier to kind of get the catheter in if the patient's more relaxed. So uh, we No we question. Yeah, and, and that's easier for No everybody. question. Patient and doctor. It's so, it's so helpful when you're there. It really yeah. is. Yeah, definitely. Really like, we work on that. And then the second treatment, the purpose is basically completely different points. But uh, in the research that has come about from that treatment, it's basically to help prevent uterine contractions. So if those are happening, I mean, from whatever reason, it can, it can kind of relax everything. So those are, uh, those are the points for that. And it's done immediately after the transfer because after that 25 minutes, those points are no longer recommended. So uh, ever, like in pregnancy, <laughs> that's actually why we have to do it right away. Uh, so we usually are saying, okay, text me right after, as soon as we can come back in the room and do the acupuncture, then we can do that. And plus their bladder is usually full and they want to get up and go to the bathroom. <laughs> so uh, we try to put those needles in, in for 25 minutes. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, the patient will return uh, for acupuncture usually five or six days after. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we want everyone to rest and you guys give really detailed instructions about that, like yeah. or the transfer and that sort of thing too. Um, but that's usually how, how we would recommend it. Mm -hmm. And um, the other thing is the uh, amount of tr uh, treatments we're looking for, like how many treatments during stent protocol. We still do twice a week. But however, like you mentioned, some patients are, they need um, more support or they're over 40 uh, and their AMH may be low or they're having problems responding to medications sometimes uh, we do an extra treatment that week we'll try to do electroacupuncture which is actually a little bit more um, not aggressive but it's actually uh, geared more towards blood flow to help with that patient hopefully you know responding a little better or um, also relaxing a little more and that sort of thing so we might schedule like every other day during because it's like 10 days really for that stimulation so we will try to do that um, it doesn't hurt you like get an extra treatment in that week i really think so um so that's what our protocol is um and 
Uh, and then another, the last question about acupuncture, they're all like kind of a big cluster of acupuncture questions. Uh, the how many times a week is ideal for acupuncture fertility? It depends on the type of treatment. So typically if patients are just trying naturally or they have like several months to prep for an IVF cycle, we're just doing once a week treatment, which is fine. So we know everybody's busy. They've got all kinds of things going on in their lives. So uh, really just once a week is usually okay. Um, and then once we get close or like a month out of uh, perhaps when they're starting birth control, we actually start twice a week treatment. So we continue that throughout the cycle until the ultrasound shows a heartbeat. Uh, and then after that, we do once a week during the first trimester. So that's been, it's not like we're, oh, yeah, you're pregnant. Okay, bye. <laughs> there's a lot of things that go, happen after that pregnancy test. And there's the stress doesn't go away. It's still, you know, then patients who have had, Perhaps uh, failures or miscarriages have a little bit more anxiety yeah. too. Um, so yeah. getting through that is really important. If patients have had any repeated losses, we try to continue I'm sorry, at least until two weeks beyond the day, the week of their last uh, loss. So, um, so, but I think the the first trimester it's kind of a relief. A lot of patients are feeling a lot better. We do nausea points. We do things of that way nature uh, to help prevent that. And by 12 or 13 weeks, they're feeling great and um we just see them as needed at that point so that would be our protocol everyone's different but um that's kind of what we what we recommend there so anything to add <laughs> no i think that's perfect i yeah. mean that's i think know, that's what you really recommend to your patients if they're doing acupuncture to try to be consistent that's what yeah yeah doing. i mean i think twice a week is is the minimum they should do mm -hmm. i usually try to tell them to go three but it's hard to get yeah Things done yeah. like that, unfortunately. Right. I mean, we try to do as much as we can in that treatment. And, you know, yeah. again, we're trying to um, fit into everyone else's schedules and yeah. all that. This yeah. is a priority, I think, when you're trying to do everything you can to maximize your... Everything. Yeah, it's, it's a full-time job. It really is. Yeah. It's like having two full-time jobs for a lot of these people. Yeah. And we hope, like, we're the one place you look forward to because some people say I look well, everybody to. says that they go there they did they, they, they relax you know they were scared mm -hmm. initially but then once they start to, they did relax they love it yeah. yeah so it's like it's like great oh yeah so hopefully we're the happy place that you come to <laughs> yeah yeah exactly yeah yeah okay we have to get to a few more questions before our time's up so um how can you swim in a pool or ocean after IUI I probably wouldn't um, you know, I'd give that chance to, you know, sperm, et cetera, to get in there and, you know, do its thing 72 hours, you know, probably for at least 72 hours after I probably wouldn't swim. Okay. And, um, what can I expect from a first consultation? I think we talked about this a little bit earlier. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's going to be, a lot, you know, a lot of uh, obviously reviewing your history, both of you, you and your husband, finding out, you know, any occupational exposures and things mm -hmm. with the husband and, you know, finding out what tests you've had and, you know, what your history has been. I mean, you've had IVF before, what happened, you know, you have frozen embryos where, you know, uh, whatever it may be. But, you know, it's obviously going to be uh, fact finding. And, um, you know, maybe an initial ultrasound, sort of get an idea what your anatomy looks like. And then from there, um, you know, we'll set up all the testing that we normally do. So, um, you know, it's going to be a few tests that we have to do, an HSG or SIS test, a biopsy, um, and, you know, and several blood samples. So, and then we meet again and discuss everything and make a comprehensive plan on what's going to work. Okay. And, um, okay. And then I will get to some of these questions now in their chat. So let me scroll down because I think I passed. Oh, okay. Here we are. Um, I'm 30 years old. My AMH is 8.24. No PCOS doing IVF. My husband has low sperm count. What are the odds? Well, at AMH eight, she's probably got mild PCO, but that doesn't matter. I mean, I think, uh, and she's 30 and she's got, you know, she's young. Yeah. Um, low sperm count, that's what IVF is made for. So, you know, prognostically, it sounds like she'd do very, very well. Mm -hmm. Statistically, um, you know, she might get a little hyperstimulation from the gonadotropins in the uh, stimulation phase, but, you know, it's all, she shouldn't get transferred. She should do a frozen transfer with an AMH that high. So, um, you know, that IVF needs to be done in two parts is what I'm saying. 
Um, but prognostically, that's that sounds like a very good prognosis patient. Yeah, definitely. And um, I guess the, they can definitely find the good swimmers <laughs> when they do. IPM. Yeah, I mean, you know, low count is nothing. I mean, you know, we have guys coming in with zero. Yeah. Um, and we managed to get, you know, sperm. I mean, some people need retrievals, uh, you know, actual sperm retrieval techniques from the urologist, but you know, low count. And if there's motility that's, you know, there, there's some motility present, then we could mm-hmm. most likely get the job done. Um, but uh, a low count is not an issue. Um, and I've had an H, okay, sorry, this was a follow-up to another question here. Um, what what uh, can women do to avoid OHSS after egg retrieval? I have PCOS and egg retrieval is next week. I'm showing 20 follicles and I'm worried. Yeah, you might get a little bit of that. Um, you know, on the one hand, it means that, you know, because the issue with PCO in, in that kind of situation is that they we have to push your, you know, your estrogen up there to mature the eggs because a lot of times the uh, there's many immature eggs at the end of that stimulation process. So in order to get mature eggs, we've got to push on your ovaries a little harder and typically the estrogen levels get pretty darn high. And if you're, you know, you tend to be more commonly OHSS occurs in young, thin PCOS individuals. So if you're young and thin, you might get a little bit of that. But we use, you know, uh, what's called a Lupron trigger now to trigger the release of the uh, follicles for uh, egg pickup for retrieval Mm -hmm. instead of HCG because HCG is, you know, hangs around a lot longer and has a higher risk of OHSS than a Lupron trigger, which has a very short half-life. So you might get some of it. It's, it's self-limited. It'll go away within several days. Um, but it also potentially means we, we did our job because we matured your eggs. And that's at the end, you want to have mature eggs to fertilize. Otherwise, you're not going to you know, have much to show for. So you might have to anticipate a little bit of that, but keep yourself very well hydrated with a lot of Gatorade and broth and a high protein diet beforehand. We have a little, uh, a little herbal, well, I guess you could say herbal, but it, it, a little tea that works is called cabbage tea. I don't know if you've heard of that, but uh, after the- Coconut water, coconut after, water. Well, yeah, coconut water and uh, boiling a head of cabbage smells pretty strong, but it actually can help a lot with the symptoms. We've had patients. Oh, I, I feel really? so much better, <laughs> um, but it's afterwards. So hopefully you're retreating yeah. really well and we hope, we hope that you don't get too many. Yeah. Yeah. Symptoms. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. And we have a question here. I had four miscarriages and I found out I have cardiolipin. Do you think IVF would be a better option for me? That's, that sounds like a serious issue. Um, yeah, well, it depends on your age, obviously, also. Um, you know, if you're a little older, you might want to obviously do IVF from the uh, standpoint of doing also PGT, making sure that didn't cause any of your miscarriages, because just you have one thing doesn't mean you don't have potentially another thing, especially if you're older. You might have, uh, you know, higher risk of um, aneuploidy or abnormal genetics. Um, so IVF would give you that double check, uh, possibly also um, freezing embryos for next time. But, you know, with cardiolipin syndrome, you got to have that treated. You know, obviously you'll need blood thinners, but uh, the question is also probably steroids uh, to reduce that antibody a little bit and then uh, Lovenox blood thinner. But most likely you're under the care of either a rheumatologist also and or hematologist that could advise you also better on this if you really truly have the syndrome. Yes, for sure. And I mean, I know these are such really, really good questions. And I'm yeah, that is a good question. We're out of time. So unfortunately, but uh, definitely, uh, these some of the questions are very specific. And I think that it would be good to talk a little bit more in depth about these things. So if you are having issues um, and you want to get a very specific answer, I would definitely re- recommend a consultation with Dr. Gelman. And, yeah, and, be happy to see you. Yeah, what's going on more. And 
And um, as far as what the acupuncture goes, I mean, definitely we uh, do phone consultations as well, like 10, 15 minute consults for free. And, you know, we can discuss if you have any questions about what goes into the treatments and when and all the logistics and, uh, you know, a little bit about your situation. Um, it's definitely easier to answer than um, answering the questions on, on the chat. But, um, but I definitely think that a lot of this information will be very helpful. We're going to post this and our story. And we're also in the process of posting all of these Q and A's on our YouTube channel so that they will be kind of a, they're in a collection. Great. Oh, great. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. And we do have our fertility, uh, fertility yoga sessions. A couple of those already on, on YouTube. Um, oh, wow. So, are, yeah. you, are, you doing, are you doing the handstand again? No, I can't. We're not, we're <laughs> like, like huh? you know, we're not doing handstand, but, uh, but really, we've had someone actually fall asleep in our class, which is really cool. <laughs> really? Wow. Um, we had someone from India, someone from, from Honduras, from different countries, actually. Really? On there. And it's really fun. So um, it's very, very, very cool. So if you guys ever want to join tomorrow night, we're going to be, Dr. Kellen, you can join too from Zoom. It's at 630. So <laughs> it's very, uh, it's with, you know, blankets, pillows, really calming. And um, we try to do some good visualizations that so yeah. uh you and your partners are welcome to join you guys and um we will be back again next wednesday with dr ellen wood uh to answer questions as well and don't forget to post your questions because we'll get to those earlier uh the ones that you send uh ahead of time and um also feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions at all we're happy to yep. help you. be happy to see any of you if you want a consultation we even do you know the virtual Mm -hmm. right. As I said before, if you're in another country, we could ab absolutely do a virtual consultation. So yes, we're happy, we're happy to help you. Yes. So thank you so much, Dr. Gelman, for answering My pleasure. your questions. And we look forward to again next month. Yep. Um, and I don't exactly know the date, but we're going to put it out there. And we will see all of you guys soon. And have a great week, everybody. And Bye, everybody. Stay well. Yes. Bye, okay. everyone. Bye-bye.